I would like to welcome you to this webinar hosted by the Office of National Drug Control Policy, the ONDCP, and the National Association of Drug Courts. This webinar is being recorded. Should you need to adjust the presentation view on your computer screen, you may do so by simultaneously clicking the control and the plus or the control and minus button on your keyboard. There will be a Q&A session during which presenters will answer questions submitted through the registration process. At the beginning of the Q&A segment, you'll receive instructions for submitting additional questions following the webinar. Answers to these questions will be posted with the webinar recording. If time permits for live questions, you'll also receive instructions on how you may ask a question at that time. Please note that all lines but the speaker's lines will be muted until further notice. And without further ado, here is Peter Gomez. Thank you, Jamie, and uh, thanks to everyone who has taken time out of their busy schedule to join us today. We're truly gratified by the interest in today's session. Uh, more than twice as many as we had anticipated registered. I think this speaks to the timeliness and importance of the topic we're addressing today. Drug courts, we know, are experiencing firsthand the impact of our nation's opioid crisis. You bring not only commitment, but a unique skill set and your courts serve as a critical bridge between the nation's public safety and public health efforts. During today's session, we will hear from NADCP CEO Carson Fox, who will help frame the discussion and provide information on the resources available through NADCP. Mr. Fox will be followed by Dr. Lawrence Westreich, a past president of the American Association of Addiction Psychiatry with expertise in medication-assisted treatment and co-occurring substance use and mental health disorders. Dr. Wayfrick will, be, will provide a brief overview. Wayfrick will provide a brief overview on, of MAT. He will be followed by the Honorable Joseph Blankenship, presiding judge of the Stone County, Missouri Adult Drug Court, which has been selected as a national mentor court through NDCI. Kimberly Kozlowski, project director of the Syracuse Community Treatment Court and Onondaga County Family Treatment Court, will present after Judge Blankenship. Both presenters will share about their experience integrating MAT. Following our two court presentations, Sonia Harper of NADCP will lead a session in which the questions you submitted during registration will be addressed. Before that, though, I have the distinct honor uh, to introduce a man who has provided exceptional national leadership in all areas of national drug policy and who has led an unprecedented rebalancing of national drug control policy that emphasizes science-based approaches and coordination of law enforcement, criminal justice, and public health efforts, something that drug courts embody. Michael Botticelli, Director of, of National Drug Control Policy, is not only the first person to serve in this position with a public health part, background, he is also the first person who is openly in recovery to serve in this role. With that, uh, I would like to introduce Director Michael Botticelli, sir. Thank you, Peter, for that introduction, and good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, as the case may be for some of you. We're glad you could uh, join us today. Uh, thanks for joining this webinar on the use of medication-assisted treatment in drug courts, and thanks to all of our presenters for joining us today. Carson Fox from the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, Dr. Lawrence Weisrich, uh, Judge Blankenship, Kim Kozolowski, and Sonia Harper. Thank you for your work uh, that you do every day and for being on this webinar. We're here to talk today about how drug courts can help us end the national opioid epidemic. As you know, in 2014, more than 47,000 people died from a drug overdose, and more than 28,000 of those deaths involve opioids. And we all know that this is one of the biggest public health crises that we have ever faced. We know that treatment is the key to recovery for many people, and that we can treat opioid use disorders and help people achieve recovery and live healthier and more productive lives. But right now, too many people end up incarcerated instead of receiving the treatment that they need. According to a recent study in New York, people who were involved in the criminal justice system, either through incarceration or probation, as a result of felony drug-related charges, were 50% more likely to encounter the criminal justice system again within two years if they did not receive treatment for their substance use disorder. And it's time, and we're happy to say that our country is pursuing both criminal justice reform and making sure that people with substance use disorders get the treatment that they need. And that's where you all come in. For, you know, for a very long time, I've said that drug courts have led the way for making the case for criminal justice reform and alternatives to incarceration. 
they're one of the best ways we can help people with substance use disorders who become involved with the criminal justice system to get that important second chance at a healthy and productive life. I know many of our country's drug courts use medication-assisted treatment, and I'm very glad that that's the case because medication-assisted treatment is the standard of care for people with an opiate use disorder. When used as part of a comprehensive approach that includes other behavioral and recovery support services, medication-assisted treatment is a proven evidence-based method to help treat people with opioid use disorders and help them achieve recovery. As with any other disease, people with substance use disorders should have access to the full spectrum of services because everyone is different. The treatment that works for one person may not work for the next. I've met people all across the United States who told me how the stigma associated with their substance use disorder was a barrier in seeking treatment. We can end stigma and get people the treatment they need, and our nation's drug courts have an opportunity to help people achieve and sustain long-term recovery so that they can live a healthier and more productive lives. The administration continues to build on its efforts to make sure that everyone who needs treatment can get it. The President has requested an additional $1.1 billion of new funding in next year's budget. This money will help get treatment to anyone with an opioid use disorder who seeks treatment, and we need Congress to move forward and fund this critical effort. So to any drug court professionals watching today's webinar who aren't sold on medication-assisted treatment or aren't sure how to make it a part of your program, I encourage you to listen to our presenter's stories and think about how you can integrate this treatment in your drug court and help people save lives. Thank you for all the work you do every day and to help move our country from crisis to recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Director Botticelli, and with that, I would like to uh, hand the floor over to uh, Mr. Carson Fox of NADCP. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Director Botticelli. Hello, everyone. Drug courts are the most effective intervention for people in the justice system with substance use disorder. For over a quarter century, drug courts have been on the forefront of providing evidence-based treatment to individuals in the justice system. As the director said, the nation is in the midst of an opioid crisis. This crisis has highlighted the need for access to medication-assisted treatment in drug courts. Drug courts have answered this need, and many drug courts are shining examples of how to effectively use medication-assisted treatment with justice-involved persons. But we have more work to do. Next slide, please. A study published in 2012 found that while 56% of drug courts offered MAT, 98% of drug courts reported participants using opiates. The study also showed that barriers to the use of MAT included costs and program policies. A targeted educational initiative is needed to increase awareness among drug courts of the treatment and criminal justice benefits of MAT. Next slide, please. NADCP has made the adoption of MAT a priority and is working to ensure all drug courts follow best practices related to MAT. The use of MAT when medically necessary should not prohibit any individual from gaining entry into a drug court, remaining in a drug court, or completing a drug court. In 2011, the NADCP Board of Directors issued a resolution regarding the use of MAT in drug courts. The resolution states, in part, the decision whether or not to allow the use of MAT is based on a particularized assessment in each case of the needs of the participant and the interests of the public and the administration of justice. Next slide, please. Furthermore, in 2013 and 2015, NADCP released Volume, two, volume 1 and Volume 2 of the Adult Drug Court Best Practice Standards. The standards make several references to the use of MAT, including in Standard 1 on target population, drug courts should not prohibit individuals with a valid prescription for MAT. In Standard 2 on historically disadvantaged groups, 
A study of Proposition 36, which is a type of court-referred treatment program in California, found that African Americans were less likely to receive MAT. Drug courts must ensure equivalent treatment. And in Standard 5, substance abuse treatment. Participants are prescribed psychotropic or addiction medications based on medical necessity as determined by, treating, by a treating physician with expertise in addiction. Next slide, please. In April of this year, NADCP, in cooperation with the Office of National Drug Control Policy, released a dynamic MAT online course for the drug court field. This online course, conducted in partnership with the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, is designed to give drug court and other treatment court practitioners information to ensure best practices related to the use of MAT. This online course is available through the National Drug Court Resource Center and the NADCP websites. Next slide, please. We are making great progress, but there is more work to be done. Over 20 states report that the adult drug court best practice standards have already been incorporated into new or existing state standards. And a recent analysis of data confirms that an individual in drug court is 10 times more likely to receive medication than an individual on probation or parole, and five times more likely than a typical patient in substance use disorder treatment. Next slide. As they have done for 25 years, drug courts are leading the way in providing access to evidence-based treatment for persons in the justice system. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Carson. And with that, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Lawrence Westreich, who will uh, provide uh, an overview of MAT for us. Dr. Westreich. All right. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to be talking with you today about medication-assisted treatment. I'm going to focus specifically on the medications used to treat opioid use disorder. Uh, I am an addiction psychiatrist. I'm on the teaching faculty of New York University's Medical School in the Division of Alcoholism and Drug Abuse, and I treat patients using these medications. I'm really delighted to be speaking with you. The overdoses and life-stealing effects of opioid drugs do necessitate some measures which can fairly be called counterintuitive, amongst them medication-assisted treatment. I don't mean to assert that medication-assisted treatment is a cure-all for opioid addiction. It really isn't. Rather, as Director Botticelli just said, and as Mr. Fox reiterated, it's one arrow in the quiver that can benefit, benefit some patients enormously and should be considered for every opioid-using patient. Of course, there's more material to cover than I can in a few minutes. I'm going to put my email address up at the end, and I'd be happy to refer you to more uh, in-depth information. Next slide, please. It's important for drug courts to distinguish addiction, now termed a substance use disorder, from physical dependence. According to our Bible of Psychiatric Diagnosis, the DSM-5, a substance use disorder is a pattern of using alcohol or another substance that results in impairment in daily life or noticeable distress. There are many other diagnostic criteria, including taking more of the substance than intended, a persistent desire to cut down, craving, or a failure to fulfill major life obligations, like a job or a marriage. But the bottom line is that addiction causes definable harm to the person. Next slide, please. That is very different from physical dependence on a substance, in which the patient has a tolerance to the substance and might experience withdrawal if he or she stops the substance. The main thing is that a substance use disorder causes problems in a person's life, and physical dependence does not necessarily cause problems of itself. Next slide, please. Agonist treatment, for our purposes, using methadone or buprenorphine, consists of using a medication in the same class as the abused drug to prevent withdrawal and craving and to intentionally cause tolerance. It is absolutely not substituting one addiction for another. The person being successfully treated with methadone or buprenorphine maintenance is physically dependent but not addicted. The, person, the patient takes the medication, like others take insulin or antihypertension medications, to improve their physical well-being, not to get high. The tolerance which they develop, which is intentionally created, means that the patient does not get high but is free of craving or withdrawal. Also, medication-assisted treatment can be used either for detoxification or maintenance. I'm talking most, mostly about maintenance today. Next slide, please. The FDA-approved medications for the opioid use disorders are the following. First, methadone, which is a full agonist. 
That is, it does the same thing as abused opiates like heroin, morphine, and hydrocodone, though the effects are slightly different, as I will explain in a moment. The potential side effects of methadone, which we see, are over-sedation, uh, and that's usually because of an inappropriate dosage or the use of other drugs. It is important to understand that opioid agonists like methadone or buprenorphine cannot prevent the use of substances such as cocaine, alcohol, or Xanax. Secondly, buprenorphine, which is a partial agonist. Again, it has the same effects as abused opiates, but also blocks the opioid receptor at high dosages. Patients who are appropriately prescribed buprenorphine do not get high, they get, quote, regular, in the sense that they are able to go about their daily activities without impairment. Thirdly, naltrexone is a full blocker of the opioid receptor. All it does is entirely block the opioid receptors in the brain. Someone who has taken naltrexone will feel no effect from the subsequent use of opioids. Next slide, please. So how do doctors decide who is appropriate for agonist treatment with methadone or buprenorphine? Usually the potential patient must be older than 18, and a good guideline is that they have been addicted to opioids for more than a year. Although obviously, in a case where lethal overdose appears to be impending, a much shorter time frame would be appropriate. Next slide, please. A diagnosis of an opioid use disorder requires an inpatient examination, review of the history including medical records, drug testing, and sometimes other more sophisticated measures. Regular drug testing is important to see what, if any, other substances the patient is taking and to assure that the patient is actually taking the prescribed medication. Although no drug testing program is perfect, having a state-of-the-art program in place will be of enormous benefit to the patients involved. Next. Like all medications, methadone has benefits and downsides. When used properly, methadone will stabilize the addicted person's life overall, improve health and nutrition, decrease criminal behavior and injection drug use, and increase employment. The potential downsides of methadone are the risks of overdose, of oversedation, withdrawal if stopped, diversion, and of course the emotional meaning of being on a long-term maintenance treatment for some individuals. In addition, a patient taking methadone must attend a methadone clinic, some of which are havens for drug selling. Next slide, please. The Drug Abuse Treatment Act of 2000, or Data 2000, permits physicians who are specially trained and licensed to prescribe the opioid medication buprenorphine outside of the traditional opioid treatment programs, the methadone clinics. It has allowed buprenorphine to become available like any other medication from a doctor's office. The main differences between buprenorphine and methadone, and these are really important differences, are that buprenorphine is much less likely to cause an overdose, is less potent than methadone, so has less value for addictive use, and is available outside of the methadone clinics. Next slide, please. The opioid antagonist or blocker treatment can be highly effective in preventing the use of opioid drugs and is available in pill form or an injectable form. However, it is relatively unpopular with patients, necessitates a seven-day period of sobriety before initiation, and suffers from compliance problems. Next slide, please. So who is a candidate for naltrexone? The patient must be opioid-free for seven days, be free of serious liver or kidney problems, and of course not have an allergy to the medication. As with all medications, the patient must consent, which is often the rub with naltrexone. Next slide, please. This is a website which provides information and clinical support for those interested in learning more about opioid treatment. As you can see, a broad coalition of treatment groups has collaborated on putting together this program for educating clinicians. Next slide, please. This is my contact information. Some challenges we in the field of addiction treatment are facing are, number one, educating about the available treatments for the addictive disorders. Number two, disseminating evidence-based treatment to clinical facilities, prisons, jails, and drug courts. And three, training enough buprenorphine prescribers to meet the clinical need. I would be very happy to refer you to more information to help you get a more complete understanding of medication-assisted treatment. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Dr. Westreich. Uh, and now I would like to introduce the Honorable Alan Blankenship, who is the presiding judge of the Stone County, Missouri Drug Court and, DW and DWI Court. Uh, and we look forward to hearing his insights on the actual application of MAT uh, in uh, the court setting he oversees. Judge Blankenship. Thank you. Stone County is a rural, rugged, beautiful area in southwest Missouri adjacent to Arkansas. Conservative, a law and order attitude is shared by most that live here. 
We are seeing a marked increase in cases where various forms of opiates, such as heroin and prescription medications, are the drug of choice. Our drug court program started in 2004. We did not originally offer MAT as a part of our treatment programming. Views on the topic among our drug court team ranged from skeptical to open opposition. I must confess I was not originally a fan of MAT. My knee-jerk response was, why would we give a drug to a drug addict or alcoholic to cause them to not use drugs or alcohol? It made no sense. Next slide. In 2008, I heard a presentation about medication-assisted treatment at Missouri's Treatment Court Professionals Annual Conference. The next day, I spoke with a treatment expert who I respected and started asking him questions about MAT, such as, how do these medications work? Do they actually improve treatment engagement and effectiveness? Do they improve long-term treatment outcomes? I learned the medications themselves were not a substitute for effective treatment. They helped people benefit from treatment and help them manage their disorder. Our program then made a decision to pursue the use of medication-assisted treatment in our drug court and later our DWI court. After learning scientific evidence supporting the use of MAT, it made sense to do so. Our team and I changed our minds, changed our policies, in becoming open to the idea. Treatment providers in our area were not generally using medications at the time, but one of our drug court providers was considering it. This we strongly encouraged. We helped them recruit a local physician to assist in providing medications and help to coordinate MAT training for their staff. Our program began using MAT uh, in 2009 with Vivitrol a monthly injectable form of the medication naltrexone, which was approved for use for alcohol use disorder. Vivitrol is not a narcotic, is not addictive. There's little risk of the medication being abused by the participant when properly administered. And for our program, it's relatively easy to monitor medication compliance. We then began using Vivitrol for opiate use disorder in 2010, contemporaneous with the FDA approving it for that purpose. Since then, we have added the active use of buprenorphine, or Suboxone, as an alternative medication for treating opiate use disorder. We've learned participants are not all the same. Different medications are appropriate for different people. We also allow methadone, but this medication is not frequently used in our particular programs, primarily because it's not easily available in our area. When a person already receiving medication-assisted treatment is referred to our program, we seek to continue them with the medication they were prescribed so long as they are not misusing or abusing the medication and it is aiding in their recovery. Vivitrol, however, remains our most commonly used medication for participants with either opiate or alcohol use disorder where the long-term treatment goal is abstinence. Suboxone is generally used for participants with chronic pain, which is not effectively managed with alternative non-narcotic medications or pain management strategies. Suboxone is also considered for use when a participant is not medically cleared for Vivitrol or where, where Vivitrol fails to be effective. Our drug and DWI court programs combined typically have from 100 to 125 participants with 10 to 15 percent receiving MAT at any one time. That percentage will increase with increasing numbers of participants with opiate use problems, heroin and prescription opioids. We have learned there are some people who, despite their best efforts and the best efforts of our program, will fail treatment without the use of appropriate medications. After seven years of experience using medications as a part of our treatment programming, over 70 persons have used MAT with over 80% successfully graduating our programs. The use of medications is an absolute game changer in treating persons with opiate or alcohol use disorders. The decision to offer MAT to a participant in our program is a treatment decision. Our treatment providers are guided by our use of standardized screening and assessment tools, identifying participants who are high risk, high needs, which our program serves, and identifying their use disorder as moderate to severe. The medication used is also a treatment decision between the provider and the participant. 
Participants on Vivitrol typically take the medication for seven to nine months, sometimes longer. The decision of when to stop the medication is made by the participant in consultation with their treatment provider and the medication provider. The decision to taper off Suboxone or Buprenorphine is also the participants. Some taper off in the seven to nine month time frame similar to Vivitrol. Others remain on indefinite maintenance. Next slide. We have provided training to our treatment court staff, all disciplines, about MAT from the inception of its use. Basic understanding of medication-assisted treatment within our team aids team discussions and generally makes our program more MAT capable. We require participants to sign authorizations allowing our providers to communicate with a provider of medications to ensure the participants comply with their requirements associated with the medication use. We coordinate our efforts. Monitoring participant compliance is very important. Except for Vivitrol, medications are generally self-administered. It is important for the team members, particularly our treatment counselors and probation officers, to be mindful of potential side effects of medications and also the potential effects and risks of not taking the medications as prescribed. Our probation officers often require participants on medications to bring their prescriptions to meetings to help ensure they are taking the medications as prescribed. Providers of medications such as Suboxone are encouraged to dispense small quantities to participants, to participants early in therapy to help prevent medication misuse or diversion. Robust, frequent, randomized drug and alcohol testing is critical. We include in our regular testing buprenorphine, or Suboxone, and Methadone. Participants on one of these forms of medications should be testing consistent with the medication. We also look for diversion of these medications to other participants in our programs. Participants must engage in effective individualized substance use treatment. The medications themselves are not treatment, but an aid to treatment. Drug, DWI, and other treatment courts is an excellent environment to utilize medications because the high program structure, the intense supervision, effective treatment, drug testing, and the team's ability to monitor and support participants while taking medications. Next slide. Funding for program costs is always a big topic of discussion. Funding for our program is provided by most insurance, Medicaid, and through the VA for those receiving VA benefits. In Missouri, our Department of Mental Health created funding specifically for Vivitrol, which we accessed through one of our treatment providers. Our state legislature recently appropriated funding for our next fiscal year for drug and other treatment courts to pay directly the cost of medication-assisted treatment. Our legislature recognized MAT is an important treatment tool and is good public policy. Identifying primary care providers qualified to provide medications to our participants is ongoing. Inviting them to observe a treatment court session and introducing the treatment court team to them is helpful in forging relationships. Stigma. Social stigma attached to addiction is influenced by perceptions of the role of choice versus compulsion in addiction. The motivation for additional initial drug use, escape from pain versus a search for pleasure, and whether addiction is related to a socially defined good or bad drug. The use of medications to treat addiction remains polarized. Generally speaking, the use of Medication-assisted treatment remains obscured from full legitimacy as a medical treatment by the public, some healthcare professionals, and the recovery community in spite of the overwhelming body of scientific evidence supporting it. It has been our experience that advocacy, education, and training and increased interpersonal contact between stigmatized and non-stigmatized groups are effective strategies to address labels and break down stigma. Next slide. MAT in our program is voluntary. The decision to use medications is the participants. After medical screening and informed consent, no one is coerced to participate in MAT. 
although we strongly encourage those who we feel would benefit from it. We document our MAT policy and procedure along with establishing memorandums of understanding between providers and the court. Our probation officers and treatment providers play an important role by monitoring participant adherence with their MAT and ensuring the participant engages fully in their individualized treatment plan. Medication-assisted treatment is also included in our participant manuals defining our program's expectations in relation to taking medications. Next slide. The decision for us to use medication-assisted treatment was driven by scientific evidence, research, and data. However, participants in our programs are real people, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, neighbors. Patricia was arrested in Stone County in 2010 for her eighth DWI. She had already served over two years in prison for DWI in another state. Instead of prison, she entered our DWI court program. A generational alcoholic, she was a very sick woman. A severe alcohol use disorder. After medical detox, during residential treatment, she was screened for and offered Vivitrol. Within a couple of days, she, was, she told her counselor she thought she was going crazy because her mind was quiet. She no longer had cravings for alcohol, enabling her to engage in treatment, graduating from our program. She loves today being a sober wife, mother, grandmother, and works tirelessly in a peer recovery community helping others. She has over six years sustained sobriety. Brad had a probation violation for drug use in a St. Louis court. Instead of prison, the court referred him to our program because his family lived in Stone County. He had a severe opiate use disorder. Brad complied with everything our program asked him to do, except, despite his best efforts, he could not stop using opiates. He was referred for MAT and was started on Vivitrol, not distracted by persistent cravings, Brad graduated our program, and now has over five years sustained sobriety from opiates. Today, he works at a job he has held for many years, raises his son, and leads a normal life. Now, Brad and Patricia's stories are shared with you today with their consent. For those who need the additional assistance of medications, Patricia and Brad are great examples why medication-assisted treatment is good policy. Thank you for allowing me to participate in this important program today. Thank you, Judge Blankenship, and thank you uh, for also sharing those stories that I think kind of bring this home in a way that sometimes the facts and figures don't. With that, I'd like to introduce Kim Kozlowski, who's the project director of the Syracuse and Onondaga, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, County Community Treatment Courts. Kim? Good afternoon. Thank you. Next slide, please. Syracuse is a community located in upstate New York. We have a population of approximately 470,000 in the county of Onondaga and 150,000 in the city of Syracuse. The city is an urban area with the surrounding communities, suburban and some, some rural farming. We are an adult drug treatment court that opened in January of 1997. Our average caseload is approximately 225. We have been successfully using MAT since we first opened. It began in our planning stages when Krauss Hospital, who has had a methadone clinic since 1975, was one of our original partners. We have introduced new MAT to our programs as it has become available. Methadone since 1997, Suboxone approximately in 2009, and more recently Vivitrol in the last year or so. Next slide. Our mission has always been to process drug or drug-driven cases through the system in an effective manner, but we really want to improve the outcomes of the drug addicted and, improve out, and improving outcomes has always meant that we would use all forms of support available, and that includes medication-assisted treatment. Next slide. So why does MAT work in Syracuse? We've been guided by five basic principles when using MAT. The first is that counseling and other services are required. Our team members emphasize that MAT is more than medication. Counseling is critical and required. 
and although the amount of counseling will decrease as participants progress, it is still required. In addition, other services that are required could include housing, uh, medical health, mental health. Medications can continue for our participants once, once they graduate from their treatment program. Particip participants are not required to taper off MAT in order to complete the Drug Treatment Court program. Participants who wish to taper are encouraged to speak with their doctors and clinicians. Prolonged medication means that the participant continues to see someone, and we believe that's a plus. The longer the participant sees someone, the better chance they have of staying out of the system and staying clean. MAT participants are not treated any differently than any other participants. Our court strategy to monitor and encourage compliance is similar to everyone else. Therefore, MAT participants don't require substantial extra work or expense. Next slide. The probation officer currently assigned to our court believes that participants generally need medication to address the physical dependence. With medication, they do not think about using drugs all day long and can focus on their recovery. Next slide. Our second principle is that the court is selective about treatment programs and prescribing doctors. Assessment for all court participants is performed by designated licensed treatment programs. MAT is also provided by licensed program or physician. The court chooses the MAT provider, as we do for all of our programs, and we choose our MAT providers based on criteria such as accurate progress reports, regular communication, attentive monitoring, and the quality of the therapeutic relationship that they have with their patients. Participants receive MAT counseling and other services at a licensed program, or if the licensed program is full and has no room for additional MAT, we allow the MAT to be delivered by an approved physician and all of their other services and programs and counseling are done at a licensed program. Next slide. The third principle is that the court has really developed strong relationships with the treatment programs and requires, we require regular communication. Trust and communication between the court and programs is essential. If programs don't communicate sufficiently, we, dis we discontinue using them. We also use memorandums of understanding between the partners and the court. But the memorandums of understanding not only include what we would want from our partners, but what, what the court will do in return as well. Our progress reports include specific and, and separate information regarding the reporting on the MAT programs. Next slide. The fourth principle, and perhaps one of the most important, is that the judge relies on the clinical judgment of the treatment partners and the court's clinical staff. My judge has recently said, not using MAT is like repairing a car without a wrench. Our judge, our judge does not act as a clinician and believes that decision making should be evidence based, made by clinicians. The judge never withhold MAT as a sanction, and all decisions about MAT are based on clinical, clinical criteria. Prior illicit use of MAT before entering into a drug court won't disqualify a person from MAT. We don't condone the illicit use, but we certainly don't deny access to it based solely on their prior illicit use. We work to get participants into a to get participants a legitimate prescription for MAT so that we can aid in their recovery. The district attorneys and probation officers share our same approach, but the full drug court team's endorsement of MAT is our goal. It's not a prerequisite. Next slide, please. Recently, the ADA assigned to our court said, I'm not a treatment provider or a doctor. How can I say you, need, you don't need MAT? Next slide. Finally, our, fi our fifth principle in dealing with MAT in our program is monitoring for illicit use of MAT medication is, is critical to our program. We work together to share information with our partners, and that includes random and regular drug testing protocols, 
We were testing for what they should have in their system and what should not be in their system. We engage in pills and strip counting on occasion, and we share that responsibility so that it's not a burden, oftentimes with our halfway houses or other programs. Behavioral observation is key. Appearance, participation, truthfulness, and unusual changes in behavior. I think sometimes we forget the value of the relationship with the client and rely too heavily on science. Case managers, therapists, probation officers, and others get to know our participants very well, and behavioral observations can be key to avoid relapse or misuse of medication. Communication with our treatment providers and with our participants. Regular and honest contact with our clients. We share information regularly through email, phone, court appearances, meetings, written reports, and we discontinue referrals to any agencies with inadequate communication or reporting. Communication early and often with a problem-solving approach helps us help the participant. Next slide, please. So a few of the lessons learned, as one of my, my case managers recently said, it doesn't take much to incorporate MAT. All you need is a phone, a treatment provider, a doctor. Invite these people into a room for a meeting. It's not that difficult. Participants who have the opportunity, opportunity to receive MAT tend to be more goal-oriented and stick with their plans. In turn, the court can then re retain them and get them through all of their programs. So we do not manage MAT participants any differently than others. We listen and communicate with the providers and the participants. We work with our providers for the best possible outcomes. We spend significant amount of time educating ourselves and our team on MAT protocols. We have developed written protocols for our participants and we make sure they understand what is expected of them. Getting services from licensed programs is critical for successful monitoring, and we discontinue use of programs and doctors that do not meet the court's requirements. Next slide, please. A few of our challenges continue to be not enough program slots for our participants to get MAT, and some participants begin working and lose their Medicaid and cannot afford to continue. The cost of Medicaid also varies by type and is oftentimes out of our participants' reach. And finally, as the judge mentioned, stigma from family members or others who just don't understand what the use of, how the use of MET can help their loved ones. We spend significant time educating loved ones on their families receiving MAT so that they can have the best possible outcomes. Next slide. Thank you very much for letting me present today. Thank you, Kim. Uh, we really appreciated that. And uh, Sonia, before we get started on the question and answer session, I believe we have a, uh, there we go, a wonderful photograph that I think speaks to it all to share. Perhaps Carson Fox could come in and tell a little bit more about the specifics of which court it is. But basically the caption is, if you're having a bad day, go to a drug court graduation. How true that is. Uh, uh, Carson, did you want to provide any more specifics on, uh, if you are able, on, on who is in this particular picture? I believe it's a judge and a graduate, and uh, I'm not sure who else. The director, of um, course. Yes, the director's there with Judge Jackson from this is the Washington, D.C. court. This is actually a graduation that they had last week, and Director Botticelli was the keynote at the graduation ceremony, and it was it was a wonderful ceremony. And that quote, actually, I was I was sitting there in the audience, and he said that on, on that day, and it resonated throughout the room. It was a wonderful, wonderful day. Fabulous. So thank 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 you to all of you. Before we do our question and answer, thank you to all of you for what you do, and I think that exemplifies it. With that, I'll hand it off to Sonia Harper. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we've got, uh, got, uh, got several questions that have come in. I uh, want to start here with, a, with the first one. Uh, what are the characteristics of the uh, typical drug court participant who's admitted into an MAT program? Did 
Judge Blankenship or Ms. Kozlowski, would either of you like to well, I'll, ch I'll chime in. I'll chime in. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're, we, we use the assessments and screening tools to help really focus uh, on the participants and dial into whether or not they would be appropriate or inappropriate for uh, consideration of medication-assisted treatment. Ordinarily, the people we place on medications uh, definitely are moderate to severe in their diagnosis for uh, use disorder. And, and also, what tends to characterize them is they are unable to uh, to stop using uh, the drugs or abuse drugs uh, while they're engaged in treatment. They're not ever able to develop that capability to self-regulate their behavior. Uh, put another way, their cravings and the chaos noise in their brains uh, interferes with their ability to benefit from, training, uh, from treatment and allowing the treatment to work. And for example, uh, Brad, as I mentioned, that was kind of his profile. He did everything we asked him to do, but still was not able to uh, to stop using. Yeah, I would agree with the judge. That is uh, very similar to the profile that we see in uh, upstate New York as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you to the both of you. Uh, the next question that we've got that's come in here uh, and. Uh, Dr. Westray, I think this may be uh, best posed for you. Uh, this individual is wanting to know, what is the average length of time that a person is on NAT? That's an excellent question. Um, you know, it ranges from uh, several months on to indefinitely. Um, and, and I think that's because if someone's going to be started on maintenance medication, they shouldn't expect to be off it in a short period of time because, as both the judges have said, they've already tried all kinds of other ways to stay off abused opioids. So the, the best, you know, in my practice I say you should plan to stay on this medication for six months or a year and then we'll, we'll check in and see how things are going then. That being said, if someone wants to come off a medication, I certainly respect that and help them taper off. But a recommendation should be six months or a year and then do a reassessment and see what's happening then. People come off, some people stay on indefinitely. All right, thank you. Uh, here's another question, Ms. Kowalski and Judge Blankenship, this one may be best posed for, for either of you. Um, this individual is wanting to know what are some of the challenges uh, of implementing an MAT program within an adult uh, drug treatment court program? Well, uh, I, honestly, we didn't have, uh, we didn't see a lot of challenges once our team really uh, I guess the initial challenge was making sure our team and team members and all of our key stakeholders in our program uh, understood the concept uh, and understood the, the basic science uh, supporting the use of medications. And once we crossed that threshold of understanding, the rest of it ended up fairly easy. Of course, you have to develop relationships with uh, appropriate providers of medications within your communities, within your access area. Uh, but that's an ongoing matter that you just continue to maintain. Uh, and also uh, just the, the funding aspect, frankly, uh, learning how and what are your various sources to pay for the medications used in your programs. And I might just add, Sonia, in addition to that is uh, perhaps, um, you know, the ability for those who need it to get it. You know, sometimes the programs are full. They may have to wait. Doctors might be at their, their maximum allowed prescribing. And so sometimes we have a challenge with uh, the ability to find a program for them. All right, thank you. Uh, next question here, uh, and actually, Peter, this may be uh, best geared for you. Uh, what are some of the current strategies ONDCP is implementing for addressing the opioid epidemic? All right, thank you. Um, I just unmuted. Can can you hear me, Sonia? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Well, I think that the uh, the president's um, budget, I think, outlines some of the key priorities where he uh, increased uh, uh, resources by 1.1 billion, or proposes increases budget uh, resources by 1.1 billion. We are looking at a number of things. First of all, preventing overdose and overdose deaths. Uh, so we're deploying a lot of resources and working with local governments and national organizations and state governments to 
uh, ensure that uh, first responders and others have access to the uh, life-saving drug naloxone, also known as Narcan, which can reverse the effects of an opioid uh, overdose and has saved countless, uh, countless lives. So that's part one. Somebody, uh, we need to save some, save people's lives. Part two is then, how do we get people the help that we need, that they need? Uh, that's where we focus on expanding access to treatment and expanding access to evidence-based treatment, which in the case of opioids is medication-assisted treatment. Uh, so that's one of the reasons for this webinar itself, is that drug courts provide a unique mechanism for helping people find a pathway to recovery. They've been remarkable at that. And I think they can provide a unique mechanism for helping turn around this devastating uh, epidemic that we're confronting right now. So uh, we look at how can we ensure access to the best to more treatment that is quality treatment, that is effective and that uh, follows the research evidence. I think in a nutshell, that's it as well as communication. We're training, we train prescribers or we're focusing on prescriber training uh, to make sure as many prescribers as possible know the risks. We also uh, support uh, prescription drug monitoring programs, uh, which uh, have all states but one currently have one. Uh, and that can help us find doctor shoppers. That can also help us find problematic prescribing practices and take other front-end uh, actions. And finally, um, we also um, focus on prescription drug take-back and uh, safe disposal options for uh, prescription drugs that aren't being used because we know that uh, the vast majority of diverted uh, prescription drugs come out of uh, family medicine cabinet. So that's a great place for us to start as well. So I think those are some of the key things that we're working on right now, Sonia. Peter. Uh, Dr. Westrack, next question I have here is for you. Uh, when a participant using MAT continues to use other drugs, what is the best treatment response? Uh, the best treatment response is to keep them engaged in the treatment. As several people have said today, that MAT of itself is not treatment. So if someone's taking MAT and they're using, for instance, cocaine or alcohol, um, you can increase the psychosocial treatments that they're getting for that and perhaps the medications for that. The value of having someone on, on MAT at that point is that the opioid dependence is stabilized. Now you have to work on the cocaine or the alcohol in the same way you would with anything else, either through relapse, relapse prevention, psychotherapy, um, using peer-led support groups like AA, even potentially using medications to treat the alcohol use. So the value is they're already in treatment, but you have to expand to look at the other using also. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question we have here, uh, uh, Judge Blankenship and uh, Ms. Kozlowski, um, and Will and Carson, you may also have some feedback on this one as well. Uh, this jurisdiction currently offers a Vivitrol-only program uh, as part of their drug court program, and they've got some reservations about opening up uh, the program to methadone and buprenorphine, um, and their main concern is about maintaining their program integrity. What advice would you have uh, for them to maintain program integrity while expanding their MAT options for their participants? Our program faced that same question. As I mentioned earlier, we started, our first medication we utilized was Vivitrol. Uh, and then we later added buprenorphine, uh, Suboxone, and, and from time to time we have, have somebody on methadone in our program. It, it's not really difficult. Uh, the main thing uh, that we look at is, is our drug testing to make sure that, to monitor that they're using it compliance in compliance with the, uh, uh, with the medication that they're prescribed to help ensure that the medications they're on are not diverted to other participants in the program. Uh, it also, as Kim earlier uh, uh, stated very well in her presentation, uh, observing their behaviors, observing their uh, engagement in treatment, and uh, utilizing the relationship uh, members of your team have with the participants while they're in your, their, your program. And that is one of the best ways to uh, to really uh, maintain the integrity of your program. Uh, we, uh, since we've added uh, uh, the additional medications besides Vivitrol or Naltrexone uh, to our program, it simply made our program better. Thank you, Judge Blankenship. Uh, Kim or Doug Carson, do either of you have anything to add? 
This is Carson. I, I, would, I would like to hear from Kim. I love what the judge had to say. I think, um, you know, for us, since we've had methadone since the very beginning and then we've added the other, um, other medication-assisted treatments as, the, as they've become available, I think for us it's really boiled down to, um, you know, making sure everybody understood what it, you know, what they were. But in addition, making sure we had policies in writing that we weren't just kind of, you know, going off the cuff when something new came along and that, you know, we monitor these things, as I said in my, in, in my uh, presentation, you know, we monitor people on MAT just like we would monitor anyone else and we include it in our policies and procedures manuals, we include it in our, our forms, we make sure participants understand expected of them. Um, and I think that's how we've just sort of been able to stay the course using MAT. All right, thank you. Um, if, if, I could, if I could also just offer one you know, final point on that. Uh, sure. Vivitrol is not appropriate for everybody with opiate use disorder. And there are some people who medically are, won't be cleared to take uh, Vivitrol. Uh, Suboxone or another medication is a great go-to option for those people because uh, otherwise you're basically denying them access to medication that would help them in their uh, recovery program. And thank you, and that's a great segue into our next question. Uh, Dr. Westreich, you might want to take this one here. Um, this individual is wanting to know, are there any specific advantages or disadvantages to the different medications? So is there an advantage or disadvantage to Suboxone over Vivitrol versus Methadone, et cetera? Yeah, it's really specific to the individual. As several people have alluded to, there is there are some patients who, who will only be appropriate for one of the medications and not for others. Sometimes it's because of medical reasons, because of liver problems or kidney problems. Um, other times it's because, you know, methadone is more vulnerable to overdose than buprenorphine is by a long shot, so it might be safer to use buprenorphine. Uh, there are some people who, who just uh, won't be able to manage with one or the other. And I think that's the, one of the overall points we've heard today, is that some patients are appropriate for Vivitrol or for buprenorphine or methadone, and it would be the right thing for everybody. So an individualized assessment, as several people have said, is what's necessary. And the availability of all these medications will help us treat as many opiate addicted people as possible. So it's very idiosyncratic based on their medical status. Thank you. And I've got, I think we may have time for one more question here. Uh, and um, uh, Peter and Carson, you may be able to assist with this one. Also, uh, Judge Blankenship and uh, Kim. Um, this district is wanting to know, are there any uh, fund, funding sources or grant funding sources that anyone could recommend uh, that a drug court look into to help support the costs associating with implementing an MAT program? Carson, do you want to offer up some grants? Well, there's certainly the, um, the Bureau of Justice Assistance and the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment offer grants for drug court programs, and those grants actually include different types of resources that can be included to, um, to bolster or help implement MAT programs in drug courts. Um, I'm also fascinated to hear from the two practitioners on how they built the funding piece uh, in their programs. Yep, absolutely. The other thing I might add is if the individuals are eligible for Medicaid, and I'm not sure of the answer to that question, but if they are, that could be a potential funding source for treatment sources, MAT or otherwise, uh, as well as uh, uh, standard uh, funding sources for the, for the state block grant and so forth. And I'll hand it over to our experts now. Okay, as I mentioned uh, and, and has just been stated, Medicaid is a potential source for those who are covered by Medicaid. Uh, as Carson mentioned, uh, grants available through the Bureau of Justice Assistance and SAMHSA, uh, we've availed ourselves in our, prog uh, in our program of uh, SAMHSA grants, which have greatly benefited our program and also helped provide MAT as a part of our programming. Also, uh, you know, look to your state and look, you know, talk with your legislators, talk with your uh, equivalent of departments of mental health, and, and ask questions about if funding is available through state sources. We are fortunate in Missouri that we have 
uh, funding specifically targeted for certain forms of medication-assisted treatment uh, uh, from a, uh, our Department of Mental Health. And more recently, uh, medication-assisted treatment funding is being made generally to drug court programs, treatment court programs within Missouri uh, uh, directly from the state appropriation. Uh, you know, we also, uh, you know, one of the favorite things we, we do is try to look for other people's money. Uh, sometimes there are some local foundations or perhaps a hospital who has a foundation that you can apply for a grant uh, to provide medication-assisted treatment. Uh, you know, don't, when, when one door says no or, or closes or, or, or somebody says no, keep going, keep, being, uh, keep persevering, keep being persistent and looking for funding sources to pay for MAT. It'll, it's well worth it and certainly makes our programs better. I think anybody who's uh, involved in the drug court world knows how to continually try to open doors. But the truth is, it is a real challenge. It's a real challenge for uh, people um, if they have um, Medicaid, if they don't have Medicaid, or if they have it and then as they try to move on in their lives and you know become productive, they get a job, they might not be eligible for Medicaid, then they can't you know afford the medication. So it, it's definitely a challenge for our participants and for the staffs of drug courts. And one final point on that question, this is Peter, is uh, you can always, of course, uh, reach out to your state uh, alcohol and drug abuse director. There's uh, a directory of uh, the directors for each state, and in, in states that have county-based systems, there are typically county directors, and they can be excellent partners in figuring out how to access the resources that are needed, how to link with the, the broader systems. Is that our last, is that our final question uh, for today, Sonia? Uh, yes, it is. I'd like to uh, turn it back over to you. All right. Well, then I would like to thank all our presenters for uh, a, a, a really engaging and helpful uh, presentation. I'd like to thank everybody who took part today. <coughs> we will be making a recording of the session available, and uh, information will be going out to uh, the NADCP mailing list on how to access that. Uh, Sonia, if folks have additional questions that couldn't be covered today, is there somewhere they can send those? Yes, they certainly can. Uh, you can send those uh, to us at the uh, National Drug Court Institute. You can, uh, I believe Carson had his email address on his slide there at fbox at allrise.org. You're also welcome to send uh, questions to me. That is uh, sharper or sharper at uh, nadcp.org. Uh, we also had the email addresses for our, um, our, our for Judge Blankenship, uh, also his uh, court administrator, Sean Billings, as well as Ms. Kozlowski. So they are free to send uh, any sort of questions they may have directly to any of them, and we'll be more than happy to get those answered for you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you again all for participating today. We hope you found this useful, and uh, we would like to do anything in our power to help you make this happen in your court. So thank you all again.